Isaac Asimov once said, The saddest aspect of life right now is that science fiction gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. The year is 2020, and not only are we in a global pandemic, but we're also witnessing our world transform before our eyes. Topics such as authoritarianism and corporatism are hot on our lips. Many science fiction fans are eager to call out dystopian present as Orwellian, or as something out of Blade Runner, or Brave New World. When China announced its social credit score system, Westerners compared Xi Jinping to a villain at a Black Mirror. Science fiction, it seems, is prophecy. Considering that the 21st century is often called the Asian century by some, it is no surprise that science fiction films from Star Wars Attack of the Clones to Blade Runner 2049 use East Asian aesthetics. Many academics are quick to call this Orientalism and imply that the science fiction genre is guilty of racism. Yet let's take a step back and ask ourselves, why does science fiction love East Asia? I'm Madeline Rose Jones and you are watching Snowy Fictions. Before I begin, a few disclaimers. Although East Asia has a short influence on science fiction, it is not the only one. One can't neglect the influence from Poland or Russia on the genre, or from legends such as Jules Verne or H.G. Wells. Think of science fiction as composed of many influences from around the world and at different times. Secondly, East Asia, for the sake of this video, means China, Japan, Hong Kong, North Korea, Mongolia, Macau, Taiwan, and South Korea. Note how different these countries are from each other. Japan will have different geopolitics and culture than, say, North Korea. It's vital that we do not simplify East Asia to a single word, image, or emotion. It's a complex region of the world. As you'll hear later in the video, a science fiction director may be inspired by an element of Chinese culture that is simply not present elsewhere. Let's start. Part 1. The relationship between science fiction and East Asia. In the Star Wars prequels, there is a planet called Coruscant. It's busy, densely populated, and high-tech. It's also a place of power, with the Jedi Temple and the Senate. A lot of the prequel narrative takes place in Coruscant. Although, Star Wars is not a dystopian series, and you can argue that it is actually a fantasy series, Coruscant is evidence of Star Wars playing futurism. Because of that, Star Wars is considered science fiction for the sake of this video. In Coruscant, there are blazing neon lights and advertising. During Attack of the Clones, where Anakin and Obi-Wan track down an assassin, we witness a visual and sensorial assault. There's bombarding advertising everywhere, flying cars approaching and loud club music thumping. Coruscant is reminiscent of the original Blade Runner movie with an urban and ap apocalyptic feel. Yet, it is not just Blade Runner that inspires Coruscant. Look at Fritz Lang's 1927 film, Metropolis. The soaring skylines are reminiscent of New York City and the Art Deco movement. As we know that America is not part of East Asia, we can't argue that high-rise buildings and urban density are solely East Asian characteristics. Yet, compare Metropolis to Blade Runner. As both inspired Coruscant, we must look at the differences. Metropolis. Although commonly listed as dystopian, should not be seen as an older version of Blade Runner. The movie is almost utopian, with messages of friendship and bringing people together. The ending of Metropolis is far more certain and optimistic, whereas Blade Runner is melancholic and ambiguous. And I think that's why science fiction writers and designers take such an interest in East Asia. From a Westernist perspective, 
East Asia in the 20th century and currently represents uncertainty, evolution and change. After all, the Japanese economy in the 1980s boomed and today China dominates American foreign policy and the economics of Australia and the Asia Pacific. Many in the Anglosphere are naturally interested in Hong Kong, particularly British people, and especially in the last 18 months with protests and new security legislation. Naturally, it makes sense for science fiction to have East Asian aesthetics. Science fiction is a genre that prides itself by being similar to our own reality. And if the Anglosphere reality is being shaped by East Asian politics, then science fiction ought to reflect that. Another consideration for why Anglosphere artists took interest in East Asia was because of air travel. After World War II, commercial flying took off and now more and more people could catch a plane from LA to Tokyo. As Americans, Australians, New Zealanders, Canadians and the British or the Five Eyes fought in that war, we can understand that Korean history is also part of Anglosphere history. Now, the science fiction genre does not just exist in the Anglosphere. It's foolish to not mention that it's a thing in East Asia. From famous Japanese animes to South Korean cinema, East Asia itself also has an influence on Anglosphere science fiction. For example, Ghost in the Shell and Akira are adored by Western audiences, as well as prestigious films such as I'm a Cyborg and That's OK and 2046. In China, science fiction experienced the boom in the 90s. Today, we have popular web novels like Mo Chen Huan's The Earth is Online that introduce science fiction concepts to a young audience. My point is that in a globalised, interconnected world, countries will influence each other. Science fiction was not built solely by France or Japan. It takes inspiration from everywhere and everyone. That's why when I discuss why science fiction loves East Asia, I am not saying that East Asia is the only influence on science fiction or that the Anglosphere has a monopoly on science fiction content. What I am arguing is that artistic inspiration is often fluid and ever-changing. A lot of it is unconscious as well. It sounds bizarre to argue that contemporary science fiction is linked with East Asia in such a profound way. After all, many filmmakers and writers may not consider themselves engaging with East Asia when they produce their art. My point isn't to assign motives to anyone, but to use science fiction as a way to better understand the complexities of East Asia. Part 2. What we can learn from East Asia. When it comes to geopolitics, East Asia is complex. The British journalist Martin Jacuzzi said, The era when the United States was a dominant global power is steadily coming to an end and it must find a way of acknowledging this and training its ambitions and interests accordingly. Instead of claiming the right to continuing primacy in East Asia, for example, it should seek to share that primacy with China. Fears that America will no longer be the dominant global power are crucial to understanding international relations between East Asia and the West. In the 1980s, as I explained in my video about Blade Runner, people made similar predictions about Japan becoming a superpower in the world. Although you may disagree with Jacuzzi like I do that the United States should share primacy with China, he is correct that China poses challenges to the USA. In 2020, these tensions are high. This has led to some journalists such as Melissa Chen from The Spectator USA to call the upcoming presidential election in the USA as the China election. Also important is the frayed relationship 
between North and South Korea. In my list of disclaimers, I mentioned that East Asian countries are different from each other. That's an important distinction because although Anglosphere science fiction loves East Asian aesthetics, it's vital that we acknowledge East Asian differences and history. However, it is not my intention to paint East Asia's influence on the Anglosphere science fiction in an entirely negative light. For one, nations like Taiwan, Japan and South Korea enjoy healthy relationships with the West. There's a reason why every year East Asia receives plenty of tourism, especially in beautiful cities like Kyoto. Japan and South Korean manufacturing is a hotbed of innovation. Just as we can't simplify Western Europe, we can't dumb down East Asia to a single emotion. If there is one thing we can learn from the buzzing nightclubs in Coruscant or the futuristic South Korea in David Mitchell's Cloud Atlas, it's that East Asia is just as complex as anywhere else in the world. Westerners should never embrace tyranny as a way to rule, like the Chinese Communist Party does. But we can look at East Asia for guidance. For example, when one studies how areas of Japan look after its natural parks and resources, and how the diverse flora and fauna is often a point of pride. Westerners can and should admire that. Science fiction, in its current state, can seem pessimistic and dour about the future, and because of that, one can imply that East Asian aesthetics represent something negative. Truth is, I don't know how the future will unfold. How will Mongolia shape China's relations with the world? Will war ever erupt on the Korean Peninsula? What about Japan's aging population? The future is uncertain, and science fiction reflects that. When I researched this video, I didn't want this video to be a positive or negative about East Asia. I wanted this video to have uncertainty and even an element of chaos and confusion. Why? Because it's those emotions that sum up the 21st century or the Asian century. If you are interested in a science fiction show that has East Asian aesthetics, but without the melancholic feel of Blade Runner, then I highly recommend Firefly and the sequel film Serenity. The characters are great, and it's a fantastic mix-up between American Western space operas and East Asian aesthetics. Part 3. Orientalism and Racism Many watch the Blade Runner movies and assume that the East Asian aesthetics are racist or unfair. Fears of East Asian people being treated or seen as exotic or dystopian are common threads in film studies, especially in academia. And you know what? I understand that. I'm not arguing that there is no racism going on here, or that all cultural depictions are flattering. Yet it's unfair to assume that every use of East Asian aesthetics by a Westerner or in the Anglosphere comes from a place of malice or ignorance. What goes on in East Asia affects the whole world. Many filmmakers and writers have genuine curiosity regarding East Asia. When science fiction uses East Asian imagery and symbolism, they are acknowledging the shaping force, for better or for worse, that East Asia has. Fiction mirrors reality, and it's fitting for our science fiction films and novels to have an East Asian presence. It's also unfair to assume that any negative depiction of any East Asian country is racist. No country is perfect or above criticism. A massive problem I have with the Chinese Communist Party is that they pretend as if any criticism of them as political agents is criticism of the Chinese people. That's not true. One can criticize a government 
without being conflated to whole populations. Because of that, the Anglosphere interest in East Asia should be nourished. Writers and artists ought to have freedom to explore any anxieties or hopes they have for the future. I'd like to see an exchange of ideas between East Asia and the West, where artists, regardless of where they live, are encouraged to use science fiction to better understand the present world we live in. Going back to the Isaac Asimov quote, science fiction has knowledge, whereas society struggles with wisdom. The Blade Runner and science fiction films still haven't resulted in flying cars, but they certainly predicted the rise of China and growing themes of alienation and discontent in society. If there is one reason why Western science fiction films and books love East Asia, it's because of the need to better understand our future in the complex Asian century. As Martin Jacuz warns, I know it's a widespread assumption in the West that as countries modernise, they also westernise. This is an illusion. It's an assumption that modernity is a product simply of competition, markets and technology. It is not. It is also shaped equally by history and culture. China is not like the West and it will not become like the West. Perhaps the Asian century is not about East Asia changing because of the West, but the West changing because of East Asia. We ought to keep that in mind when we discuss today's world as we navigate through the confusion and chaos. Thanks for watching.